by the end of this talk, I hope that you'll be able to identify four threats to mental well-being and aging, to be able to describe key findings about the correlates of successful aging, to be able to discuss the impact of ageism, a negative attitude about one's own aging on older adults, as well as discuss opportunities to promote mental well-being in older adults, including those who have cognitive impairment and dementia. And really the genesis for this talk was an essay that I saw um, in 2020, and it was written by Dr. Lewis Lipsis, who's a geriatrician and a professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. And he, he, the title of his essay was, When I'm 84, What Should Life Look Like in Old Age? And in the essay, he kind of mused about things that we might actually be, to be considered perhaps social determinants that could affect um, aging. He spoke about his concerns about having appropriate housing, engagement and activities, a sense of physical security and safety, as well as appropriate health care. But those um, of you in attendance here at the ground rounds, will uh, those of you of a certain age, will probably recognize with me the obvious allusion in his title, When I'm 84, actually to the Beatles song, When I'm 64. And for the, here are the lyrics of it. I was hoping to share with you a little bit of the music, but um, perhaps that'll be for another time. So this is a very popular song that came out and actually uh, Paul McCartney was only 24 when he recorded the song and you can see what the words are. When I get older, losing my hair many years from now, will you still be sending me a Valentine? Birthday greetings, bottle of wine. If I'd been out till a quarter to three, would you lock the door? Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? So remember Paul McCartney, he's only 24 when he records this song. But actually it's interesting that so many years later when he did turn 64, he was interviewed by the Los Angeles Times about this particular song and he related kind of an anecdote that he had met someone who played the piano and often went around to what he referred to as old, an old person's home. And he said that this was the Beatles song that was most popular and most requested, but the pianist said that he had to change the lyrics to when I'm 84, because it just 64 seemed too young to the residents in the home. And to which Paul McCartney replied, if you were to write the song today, he would probably call it when I'm 94. So I think that really raises the question, what should life look like when we are 64, when we're 84? And this is a very timely question uh, because as you know, we're really in the midst of a rapid aging of the United States population. So approximately about 17% of our population is over the age of 65 now, but that's steadily increasing. And by 2060, uh, the, the percent of the population over at age 65 will be 23%. I will mention to you that actually Japan um, has about 29% of its population right now is over the age of 65. And so a year ago, in September of 2021, 20, uh, um, the Japanese government decided to change the nomenclature related to aging and stated that anybody who was younger than 75 was called, quote, pre-old. But I think, you know, the, what we can see, though, is that even here in the United States, with life expectancy at birth now about 76, it's estimated that 50% of today's babies can expect to live to 100. So that's a really remarkable thought. And it really makes us ask, well, maybe we need to rethink what does it mean to age well? What does it mean to age successfully or to sustain successful mental well-being? So I want to share with you um, a couple of quotes from two other prominent physicians who have written about this topic. And so one is Dr. Oliver Sacks, who you may um, recall is a, uh, was a well-known neurologist and author. And when he turned 80, he wrote an essay that was published in the New York Times, and the title of the essay was The Joy of Age, No Kidding. And here's a quote from his essay, and he said, I do not think of old age as an ever grimmer time that one must somehow endure and make the best of, but as a time of leisure and freedom, freed from the factitious urgencies of earlier days, free to explore whatever I wish, and to bind the thoughts and feelings of a lifetime together. 
really kind of a positive view of aging. And you'll notice the t-shirt he's wearing has the atomic number from Mercury, which was 80 kind of coinciding with his age. But a very different attitude towards aging was espoused by Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, who is a bioethicist and an oncologist on the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania, actually was appointed in 2019 to President Biden's committee on, on COVID-19. And he wrote a paper that was a, a, an essay that was published in the Atlantic Monthly in 2014 titled, Why I Hope to Die at 75, an argument that society and families and you will be better off if nature takes its course swiftly and promptly. And when he was interviewed about this particular essay, he said, well, I look at the data on Alzheimer's disease. I look at the data on loss of creativity. And 75 seems to be the right moment because the chance of disability is low and you're not at high risk for Alzheimer's disease. So in other words, to Dr. You know, to Dr. Emanuel, he's viewing aging rather, rather negatively as a time of inevitable decline in creativity, physical and cognitive functioning, and really doesn't feel that his life would hold any value after the age of 75. So is there such thing as successful aging? Well, Roe and Kahn defined it in a paper that's gotten a lot of attention, was very impactful in 1997 in The Gerontologist, and they define successful aging as really having three elements. One, the avoidance of disease. Two, no disability. And three, a high degree of cognitive functioning. And there clearly are individuals who seem to fit you know, this particular definition. And the four that came to my mind that I'm sharing with you here for this talk, I'm thinking about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who served on the Supreme Court and was a justice there until the age of 87. I'm thinking about the actress Betty White, who hosted the TV show Saturday Night Live uh, for the first time at the age of 88. William Shatner, who you'll remember was quite well known for portraying uh, Captain Kirk on the, uh, on the beloved TV show Star Trek, who actually a year ago in October, he flew on Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin spacecraft into space for 10 minutes and became the oldest man to go into space. And then, of course, there's Queen Elizabeth of England, who just recently passed away at the age of 96. And one day prior to her passing, she met uh, with the newest prime minister uh, you know, of England. But it's not just celebrities who seem to exemplify Rowan Kahn's you know, definition of successful aging. This is a, a, a description of, that I saw in, in the Wall Street Journal of a 100-year-old competitive swimmer, swimming competitively, breaking world records at the age of 100, which seems really quite, you know, really quite remarkable. But despite all of these, you know, rather successful individuals, um, there have been, a, there's been a lot of criticism about Rowan Kahn's definition of successful aging, and there are a lot of problems with the definition. First of all, it's, it has been criticized as overemphasizing physical health, and as we know, we can think of plenty of individuals who have had some sort of physical problem, a disease, and yet seem to be able to age well. And in fact, I would say that Justice Ginsburg perhaps is an example of that, because while she did serve on the Supreme Court until the age of 87, she did so while being actively treated for cancer. Um, as well as Rowan Kahn's approach seems to be an all or nothing approach that seems also to reinforce negative attitudes about aging, such as the ones Ezekiel Emanuel wrote about. But perhaps most importantly, it really is not supported by empirical research. And one of the longest studies of adult life and aging is actually of Harvard students. Actually, it would be Harvard men, because for most of the study, um, Harvard was, had, was only accepting men um, as students. This particular study began in 1938, with 268 Harvard sophomores and has followed them over the years. George Valand, a psychiatrist, joined the study team in the mid 1960s and he led the study from 1972 to 2004. He wrote a book uh, some called Aging Well, summarizing some of the things that he learned about what he, what he thought was healthy aging and predictors of healthy aging from his work in this, in, in this particular study. And he, also noted that successful aging 
was associated with absence of depression. And he said, quote, the key to healthy aging is relationships, relationships, relationships. Another individual who has written a lot about aging is of uh, the psychologist, Laura Karstensen. And she has spent her career really studying emotional regulation and how that changes with aging. She, in her work, she found that older people seem to be more skilled at managing emotionally charged interactions. And she described what she called from her work, the positivity effect, which is that compared with younger people, older people seem to attend to and remember more positive than negative information. In other words, as people get older, they seem to become more content and perhaps more positive. And she coined the phrase, the socio-emotional selectivity theory, which based on her work, she concluded that older adults place greater emphasis on emotionally meaningful goals. And she um, explained that by saying, perhaps this is related to goal, select, to goal selection being affected by a diminishing perception of time, available time. Another paper that had a quite a big of, uh, influence uh, came out um, in 2008, and these individuals, Blanche Flower and Oswald, actually were not psychologists or psychiatrists or physicians. They were economists with academic appointments at, at Dartmouth and also Warwick University in the UK. And they wrote a very highly influential paper called, Is Well-Being U-Shaped Over the Life Cycle? And they presented evidence from data from quite a, a from about 500,000 Americans and Western Europeans and concluded that well-being was actually the highest in one's early 20s and later in life, and that it actually reached a minimum in midlife. And that same paper presented this particular figure, which plotted the incidence of self-reported depression from the UK labor force survey of individuals ranging in age from 16 to 70. And in this figure, each dot represents 17,000 observations. And these authors concluded two things. One, based on their work and interpretation of the data, happiness was U-shaped throughout the life course, but also mental distress reached a maximum in midlife. Now this work and the idea of well-being being U-shaped over the life cycle has since been criticized and one of the most serious criticisms is that really all of this work, despite the buzz that came from it, was based on a single item measurement of well being and also based on cross sectional data, not on longitudinal perspective work. Perhaps the most influential and the most impactful person studying successful aging is Dilip Geste who is a, a psychiatrist, geriatric psychiatrist, and a professor at the University of California in San Diego. And he has made really very important contributions to our understanding of well-being and aging. His study that I'm going to quote a lot actually in the course of this talk is called the Successful Aging Evaluation Study, or abbreviated as SAGE, S-A-G-E. And what they did is they studied about a thousand people ranging in age from 50 to 99 in San Diego County. Um, and they were assessed through phone interviews as well as mail in surveys in which uh, individuals mailed back a, a, quite a number of self report scales. And what he found and reported is that self rated successful aging correlated strongly both with, with, with resilience and with depression he found that yes, older age was associated with worse physical and cognitive functioning, however, with better mental health functioning. And those subjects who endorsed higher levels of successful aging, this again on self-report scales, had less depression, had higher optimism and higher resilience scores. What is this term resilience? Well, as measured by, the, by these uh, particular scales that were used, individuals re reflected their level of endorsement with statements such as, I'm able to adapt to change. I believe I can achieve my goals. And feeling that they were able to cope effectively with stressful situations. So in other words, 
really resilience expresses a sense of self-confidence and being able to achieve goals and being able to adapt. And then as a result, having the ability to cope better potentially with adversity. And this has led to this uh, description of what perhaps could be described, has been described as the paradox of aging. And Thomas et al, uh, again, reporting on some of the same work from the SAGE study, um, found that yes, physical and cognitive functioning worsened, interestingly, non-linearly with age, and yet there was linear improvement in mental health. So that their, their findings actually supported evidence that a U-shaped curve was really not evident and was not operative in mental well-being with age, but more of a linear improvement that was unrelated to physical and cognitive declines. And this was this is actually a figure from their paper, again showing you can see physical health and cognitive functioning in a non-linear decline represented by the blue and green lines, whereas mental health and positive feelings about aging increasing despite those declines. So there are significant threats though to mental well-being with aging. And I'm going to talk um, about four of them. I'm going to talk about threats to mental well-being that come from um, impairments in physical and mental health, from social challenges, from cognitive decline, and also related to ageism. So beginning first with physical, mental health, and well-being. Well, certainly as we know, with age, we see obviously increased rates of disease, particularly their increased rates of cancer, increased rates of chronic illness and pain, increased uh, rates of neurologic and neurodegenerative disorders that, are, that happen more frequently with aging. And these, of course, pose threats to well-being, of physical well-being, as well as mental well-being for those individuals who are, are, are faced with these challenges. Depression also is a significant factor and, and is not rare among older adults. Um, we know that actually rates of serious depression um, vary depending on the population and are higher, about 25% in medical inpatients, about 40% of individuals in long-term care settings have significant depression. And in addition, serious depression has a high, higher rates of occurrence in certain um, physical diseases and conditions. We know that about 40% of individuals with Parkinson's will suffer from major depression, about 25% of individuals with cancer, and even 18% of individuals who have diabetes. And certainly, um, we know that major depression is a, has a significant impact on quality of life and on functioning. Interestingly, the risk of major depression, which um, is about twice as high in women than men from puberty to menopause, continues to be more highly represented in older women after menopause, and the risk is about 1.7 times higher in older women. Depression is a source of caregiver burden as well. So depression is a significant factor that can affect well-being. And there are social challenges to well-being, and I'm going to talk um, briefly about two of them. Social isolation and loneliness, loneliness is uh, quite common, particularly in older people, and a lot has been written and published on social isolation and loneliness. While they are often grouped together, they are not the same. So social isolation refers really to the objective absence of connections with other people, whereas loneliness is the subjective feeling that one is socially isolated from an other individuals, and you could feel lonely while in a situation where other people are around you. So large survey data indicate about 22% of adults over the age of 65 experience loneliness and or social isolation. There are many harmful effects of social isolation and loneliness. They are associated with worse physical and mental health outcomes. Loneliness is associated independently with depression. And loneliness is associated independently with all cause mortality. And a lot has been written, particularly about social isolation and loneliness encountered uh, by older adults during the, um, the more during some of the biggest phases, uh, most impactful phases early on of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
where many older adults found themselves unable to be in touch um, in person with their family members and with younger people. And this was exacerbated in what's been called the digital divide and that it was hard, in, particularly initially for many older adults to stay connected uh, through telemedicine, through FaceTime and other technological means of communication. And social isolation and loneliness has been um, a factor that has been uh, for which age-friendly communities are, are now being touted. And I'll talk more about that uh, later in this talk. Another social challenge to well-being is caregiver stress. There's, as you know, quite a big literature about this, that many older adults are caregivers to a spouse, sometimes to an adult child, and caregiving imp impacts both the physical and mental well-being of the caregiver. And there are other social challenges that impact mental well-being with aging as well. These include adapting to retirement, experiencing grief and loss and widowhood, as well as financial worries that may come of that one may feel that they're facing, particularly on um, a limited income. I want to talk about the particular mental well being challenges from cognitive decline and dementia. So, as we know, prevalence rates of dementia are high and are age related and increase with age. And as you also know, that although this has been such an active area of research, today in 2022, we still lack any particular pharmacologic agent that can cure or restore cognitive functioning, bring back memories that are lost, or prevent a cognitive decline from continuing. In addition, we know that neuropsychiatric symptoms are common probably in close to 100% of all individuals with cognitive impairment and dementia, and these include depression, anxiety, wandering, insomnia, sometimes um, hallucinations and delusions, as well as agitation or paranoia. Neuropsychiatric symptoms are common and they're caused, they cause mental distress for the individual as well as for their families and are frequent uh, impetus for psychiatric referral. And while there's much that we can do to manage neuropsychiatric symptoms, the diagnosis of dementia itself has significant negative implications for mental well-being. And in fact, I'm going to share with you uh, two recent papers that really highlight this. So one is a paper that came out in 2021, in which um, includes data actually from all the uh, VA medical centers in the United States. The study population was 148,000 participants, 21,000 with mild cognitive impairment, 63,000 with dementia, and another 63,000 who are comparison controls without any cognitive impairment. And what these researchers found is that there was, they found increasing incidence of suicide attempts related to the recency of a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or dementia. And you can see the two lower lines were at those individuals who at the start of the, of the study had had a prior diagnosis of MCI or dementia compared with the, the uh, light blue line, which is those individuals who had just had a recent diagnosis of MCI or the orange, the dotted orange line, a recent diagnosis of dementia. So the concerning thing is that older adults with recent MCI or dementia diagnoses were at increased risk of attempting suicide. Suicide attempts were 73% higher in patients who were recently diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment and 44% higher in patients recently diagnosed with dementia compared with the comparison group. Firearms were the most common method of attempted suicide. And importantly, no psychiatric comorbidity moderated the association between MCI or dementia and the suicide attempt. Again, underscoring that it really was, seems to be the diagnosis itself that was most strongly correlated with suicide attempt. What about suicide mortality? I just talked to you about a study that looked at suicide attempts. Well, this is a paper that uh, just came out in February of 2022. And what we can see here is that this study looked at completed suicides um, among in individuals who had received a diagnosis of dementia and were followed for a full year after receiving the diagnosis. And what they found is a significant increase for completed suicide in the first year, 
the risk was higher in men than for women. And it was highest for those men ages 65 to 74, but also high for males age 75 to 84. And this is really a significant paper because it was a national retrospective longitudinal cohort study. Um, and again, individuals over the age of 65 who received a new diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. The number of suicide deaths in the first year after diagnosis was 53% higher than expected compared with the general population of older adults. And um, this should really concern us, particularly when we're thinking about um, wanting to be transparent um, and be able to give the you know, to give and share a diagnosis and disclose a diagnosis of dementia with older adults. It really underscores and highlights the importance of suicide risk screening, but I think even most importantly, being able to have, um, to be able to fold in support and emotional support for individuals and their families at the time the diagnosis is made and shortly thereafter. The fourth area that's a, that I wanna to talk to you about that is the, really the, uh, as a fourth threat to mental well-being is ageism. So this term was coined by Dr. Robert Butler, who was actually a psychiatrist and he coined the term in 1968. He became the founding director of the National Institute on Aging, as well as the founding director of the first department of geriatrics at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. For Dr. Butler, ageism really referred to discrimination based on age, but it's come to mean more than that. And it's come to also um, um, encompass negative attitudes that uh, towards aging and stereotyped ideas in a negative way towards older people solely on the basis of age. This is a systematic review that really looked, um, searched over 13,000 papers and you can see over 600 had a full review, really looking at the harmful effects of ageism on older adults and they really surveyed the literature, not only in the United States, but in 45 countries. And what they found is that ageism causes significant inequalities and has harmful effects um, on individuals where it has an impact on whether um, uh, the type of medical treatment that is received, the timing of it, um, ageism was found to be a factor in medical decision-making and that ageism has led to worse outcomes in many health conditions, including depression. Interestingly, the fact that this that ageism is really such a global concern um, has made it um, one that, that has um, taken the attention of the United Nations and the World Health Organization. And in fact, the United Nations and the World Health Organization has declared that this decade of 2021 to, to uh, 2030 is going to be called the Decade of Healthy Aging. And they have uh, four initiatives that on a global level they want to address. And ageism is one of those four issues um, and, and action areas. But there's another type of ageism. We certainly see ageism in psychiatry. And so ageism in society. We see ageism in healthcare settings. But there's also ageism that is harmful to older adults that comes from the negative attitudes that older adults have about aging and themselves, presumably related to internalizing the very widespread negative ideas in society at large about, about aging. And the person who has really published the most on this is a psychologist at, at Yale, Becca Levy, and she has found that in in the lab, for instance, older adults can be primed with negative age stereotypes. And as a result, it negatively impacts their performance on cognitive testing. But as well, she has reported that negative self attitudes on health and aging lead to slower recovery from disability, on physical functioning, worsening recovery from cardiovascular events. And that exposure to negative age stereotypes leads to greater feelings of loneliness, uh, poor ratings on subjective health rating scales, and that having a negative self-image yourself is also associated with depression and an increased risk for hospitalization over 10 years. One study that um, she refers 
to very often actually is one that she did, looking at about 660 individuals as part of the Ohio Longitudinal Study of Aging and Retirement, matched to mortality data from the National Death Index. And what she found is that those individuals who had more positive views of aging actually lived on average seven and a half years longer than those individuals who had negative views of aging. And in all of these studies, she, she talks about them in a, in a book that was just published in 2022 called Breaking the Age Code, How Your Beliefs About Aging Determine How Long and How Well You Live. This is a book that is very readable, and it's really written for the, um, the average paper that she just um, recently published. And so what, she, what Becca Levy and her um, associates did and co-authors did in this study is they looked at about 4,700 participants over the age of 60 in the health and retirement study who at baseline did not have any dementia and followed them for four years. And they also were able to obtain APOE genotype assessments from the saliva samples collected during home visits they found that those individuals who had positive age beliefs at baseline were significantly less likely to develop dementia and that this held true even for those individuals who had the APOE E4 allele, which is most strongly associated with Alzheimer's disease. Even among those individuals, the subjects who had positive age beliefs were about 50% less likely to develop dementia than those who had negative age beliefs and suggesting that perhaps positive age beliefs could be a protective factor um, against a risk for dementia. And you can see here, this is a, um, a bar graph from her paper, again, showing that even for the participants with APOE4, those who had positive age beliefs were much less likely to develop dementia compared to those with negative beliefs. So in summary, I mean, what I've talked to you about so far is I've shared, I've talked to you about some constructs related to successful agent, aging and spoke about threats to mental well-being in aging. So what do we know, though, about any interventional studies? What, can, what do we know about what could be done that could improve mental well-being and aging? And for this, I'm going to talk a little bit about four areas, one about the treatment of depression, strengthening resilience encouraging social engagement, and addressing meaning and purpose. So again, I'm going to come back to this SAGE study that I had mentioned before and remind you that in this SAGE study, both resilience and depression were associated with self-reported self successful aging. And the effect size, interesting, was comparable to physical health. So to, again, they, they used um, self-report scales, including the PHQ-9, the Connor Davidson Resilience Scale, and came up with a 10-point Likert scale for self-rated uh, successful aging. And what they found was that those individuals who had moderate to severe depressive symptoms had similar self-reported successful aging as those in the bottom third of physical functioning uh, with no depression. So in other words, the impact of depression was just as harmful on successful aging as poor physical functioning. Now, this again shouldn't surprise us here in psychiatry, and certainly we're very much you know, concerned and unaware about depression. And I think really what this underscores again for us of how important it is to treat and recognize you know, depression. But Dalip Jeste has been at the forefront of work, you know, again, not only in identifying successful aging, but also um, as a leader in the emerging field of what's being called positive psychiatry. So unlike depression, whereas in depression, we're focusing on particular symptoms and alleviating symptoms, in positive psychiatry, the interventions are focused on promoting well-being, by cultivating more positive attitudes, more positive cognitions and thoughts, feelings and behaviors, where here the goal is really to change the attributes and characteristics of the individual to have more positive outlooks and to strengthen sort of um, kind of an inner emotional strength. 
So what are some of those interventions? So, so these would be particularly interventions that have been done to try to shore up resilience, for instance, knowing that higher levels of resilience are associated with a decrease in all-cause mortality, lower rates of depression, greater social connection, and greater independence in ADLs. We have a lot of studies that really have demonstrated the strong association of resilience with positive mental well-being. We actually don't have very many good intervention studies, particularly targeting resilience. And in part, this may be because of the heterogeneity, both in definition and operationalizing resilience in an intervention study. The ones that we have mostly include ones that are using cognitive behavioral therapy to try to change dysfunctional types of thoughts, coaching perhaps by the phone, um, phone coaching to help uh, in individuals, again, cope better and have a greater sense of self-efficacy and mindfulness training. In the realm of social uh, interventions and social connection interventions, again, we see really there's been a heterogeneity of approaches, which makes it difficult really to identify common features of successful interventions. And one review uh, looked at 16 systematic reviews and 19 uh, randomized controlled trials and noticed that of all the interventions that have been studied, these include a wide variety, including those focused on enhancing social support, increasing access to social situations, improving social skills, as well as those that perhaps using CBT are trying to address maladaptive social cognitions. And these have ranged from encouraging individuals to you know, join friendship clubs, attend daycare programs, maybe participating um, in some sort of uh, virtual kind of a setting, as well as individual therapy focused approaches. But another approach altogether, not only uh, to, is to take a community approach um, as opposed to the individual approach to strengthen um, social engagement in the community. I'm gonna give you just a couple of examples of programs that exist. One um, you may or may not be familiar with is one that uh, comes out of the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing called the CAPABLE program, which stands for Community Aging in Place, Advancing Better Living for Elders. And this program is a home-based nursing program using occupational therapists and bringing in individuals to help do home repairs and targets low-income older adults. Another example of a community program is in Vermont called the Support and Services at Home program, again, using a wellness nurse and a care coordinator. And these individuals help engage social service agencies to really help support individuals living independently at home. And while these are, you really seem like, you know, wonderful programs, they're really limited in the sense of really defined in small populations who are able to benefit. We really don't have a wide scale um, implementation of community approaches. The World Health Organization is very much focused on that and has developed what's called the Age-Friendly Communities Network, where the World Health Organization is working with its various members at local levels and national levels to develop model communities. And um, that would be a uh, conducive to social engagement for elders, focusing on safety and transport, and, and, um, as well as mechanisms to reach out to vulnerable, isolated individuals. And you could read more about this if you want to see this by going to their website of the World Health Organization Initiative. So I also want to talk about this fourth area, which is meaning and purpose. And meaning and purpose in life, which is not purpose of life, but really reflects an individual's perception that their own life and the activities in their, that they are engaging in have value and importance. So a study was done looking at 2,500 older adults, initially free of dementia, who underwent clinical evaluations every year, and whose purpose in life was assessed with a 10 item scale rating of their level of agreement with statements that they have a sense of purpose in life. And what they found was that those individuals who reported a high level of purpose in life developed incident Alzheimer's disease about six years later than those with a low level of purpose. As well, those with a high level of purpose in life died four years later than those with a low level of purpose. And these are survival curves from this paper. Um, Patricia Boyle is the first author. And you can see here at both of these curves, the green line that is, that is to the right represents those individuals who are in the 
the 90th percentile for agreement that they had the highest level and sense of purpose. In the next and last couple of slides, I really want to talk to you a little bit about, well, what about promoting well-being in individuals with dementia? And unfortunately, in this area, we have really comparatively little research has been done about how do we promote well-being in individuals with cognitive impairment and dementia. So one study that was recently published um, was used behavioral activation to promote well-being. And what these researchers did is they compared 42 individuals with mild dementia with a mini mental state exam score greater than 18 with about 21 who had what they call treatment as usual. And the behavioral activation intervention involved eight one hour sessions of somebody coming to the home and really trying to encourage the individual to re-engage, to identify and re-engage in previously enjoyed activities. So it was highly individualized behavioral activation. And what they found is that the care partner ratings of the patient's health quality of life improved at three months and was sustained even at six months. Um, and they noted they had, had improvements in the sense of having meaningful enjoyable, and enjoyable activities. So it's possible that behavioral activation may be one approach to sustaining well-being in individuals with cognitive impairment and dementia. But another may be engagement with the arts and particularly visual art. So we know there's a growing body of literature that supports the positive benefits of engaging with visual art in supporting well-being at all, at really at all points across the lifespan. And a number of studies had looked at the benefits of in-person engagement with art, which is associated with positive outcomes in well-being and mental health. A program at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City was called Meet Me at MoMA, and they had monthly programs for individuals with dementia and their family care partners. And the researchers who studied this found that there were improvements in well-being with higher ratings on self-esteem and higher ratings on quality of life among the participants. And again, this is for in-person um, programming of engaging with art at MoMA. Could the same happen for virtual engagement with virtual on, on a virtual basis with art? So there was a study that just was published actually in Frontiers of Psychology in 2022, which reported that brief interactions with online digital art demonstrated improvements in mood, um, anxiety, loneliness, and well-being. Now, this particular study did not look at individuals with dementia, but looked at really a wide range, of, of mostly of younger age group. So although they did not look at individuals with dementia, I want to briefly share with you that actually um, the results of a pilot study that I have just been doing with um, study partners, Philip Yenawine, Lolita, Nida Davolu, um, Andrea Nelson, and Miguel Ramirez Sanchez. And we were interested in whether a virtual art-based intervention um, that was you, delivered via Zoom could promote well-being in individuals with dementia and their care partners. We use visual thinking strategies, also called VTS, because it's a well-validated approach to fostering engaged discussions about visual images. And what's particular about VTS is it does not presuppose any knowledge of art or art history, and it really does not require any um, prior knowledge that you would draw from, from memory as well. So we hypothesize that perhaps VTS could be used to promote emotional well-being for persons with cognitive impairment and their care partners during the COVID-19 pandemic using this online format. This pilot study was small. We had three dyads who participated in three virtual VTS sessions, but we did find that the virtual format, number one, was feasible, that at a high level of acceptance and satisfaction, both by those individuals with cognitive impairment, as well as their care partners, and it seemed to sustain levels of well-being. So perhaps this is an area uh, for further development. So in summary, I have really shared with you that were, there have been quite a number of measures that have been used to try to address what is successful aging, what is mental well-being and aging, including resilience, including life satisfaction, with some conflicting results, mostly because of 
differences in how they are measured. And uh, in this regard, I want to quote actually Tyler Vanderweel, the director of the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard, who spoke to the Hopkins community about a week and a half ago, and he said very tellingly, what we measure shapes what we know, which I think is quite astute. I think we can certainly agree that there is face validity in promoting resilience, meaning and purpose, and social connections for sustaining mental well-being and aging. Knowing that all of these constructs are probably overlapping and probably also correlated. But what's exciting about them to me is that they all are potentially modifiable ones that could have significant, significant impacts. So if you were to ask me, how would I define mental well being and aging? And I think for me, as I think about it, I would say that it's the cognitive and affective of state of overall positivity and good mental health that is marked by resilience, resilience within illness, resilience um, in the face of adversity, that's marked by optimism, sense of self-efficacy, and marked by a sense of purpose and meaning. And that mental well-being in aging is a key element for successful aging. As a geriatric psychiatrist myself, I certainly agree with those who have been stating that geriatric mental health care needs to expand beyond treating disorders to studying and promoting factors that contribute to mental well-being and aging, uh, both in, in, in older adults who, have who don't have cognitive impairment as well as those who do have cognitive impairment. So how could we potentially promote it? And I would say, of course, it's easy to say more research needs to be done, and I certainly would agree with that. But I do think that based on what we know today, I can say a few things. Number one, again, to come back to this, it's still important to identify and treat psychiatric disorders and symptoms, including particularly major depression. We also need to more actively combat ageism and the negative views about aging um, as they occur and as we see them in healthcare settings, as we see them in development of healthcare policy. And they also are prevalent in healthcare education. We need to be able to address those. And in this regard, I'm particularly glad that the United Nations and the World Health Organization have identified ageism as one of the four target areas you know, that they want to focus on over the next 10 years. All of us in our clinical work and work can really work to foster resilience, social engagement, meaning and purpose in our work with our older patients. And then I think on the larger level, we need to be thinking more specifically about targeting the social determinants that if, um, such as loneliness and social isolation, and how can we impact and uh, diminish those. And in this regard, to encourage healthcare policies and programs that provide support and social connections for seniors in their communities. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm going to stop screen sharing. So uh, hopefully we can, um, I can take your feedback and hear from you. Fantastic, Susan. Wow, that was really masterful, uh, beautifully done and fascinating overview of, uh, of an interesting area. I mean, there's so many things to talk about, but uh, I will just uh, ask you a question that happens to come from a conversation I had this morning with Al Garcia from our Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research. You may know that they're, they're doing a study at the moment where they're treating people with mild cognitive impairment and, and depression with, with psilocybin. Uh, but it makes me think of uh, one of the really striking things you said, which was that um, that people with negative, more negative attitudes about aging, or to switch it around, people with more positive attitudes about aging live longer, I think, at least in one of your studies, yes. which, which was pretty strike, pretty remarkable. But it makes me think of the, uh, the, the Psychedelic Center's study looking at treating uh, people with cancer who had symptoms of depression and anxiety with psilocybin and and so many of them had a fear of dying. And then after treatment with psilocybin, no longer had a, uh, the same kind of fear of dying. And I, I think of fear of dying as, as one, of the, one of the aspects of, of having a negative attitude about aging. That's one of the big negatives, that sort of fear. Uh, would it make any sense to think about psilocybin in that context as a way of enhancing people's attitude about, about aging? Well, I think that's a really fascinating question, and that's um, and that certainly is um, something that could be certainly could be studied. You know, absolutely. Again, these are you know they're correlations. We don't really know about causation. These are things that's correlated. So I think I want to just have that caveat. Right. There's lots of associations. 
Is it a causation? It seems, you know, it sounds very simplistic. You know, Becca Levy um, postulates that there are changes that are happening on the neurobiological level that are supporting this. And, and um, very likely there are that we don't really know what they are. You know, the point is that if you can modify and change, you know, your what you think and how you actually believe it can have a huge impact on well-being. And so I think all the, you know, these different kinds of up of ways that we might potentially change how we think and feel have potential and should be studied. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I will say yeah. a lot of my older patients are very open to psilocybin. And okay. So um, I think they, if they were included in the study, that many of them would probably oh, want to sign up for it. Interesting. Well, Diana Miller says, what are, what are your thoughts on social media and aging? I'll add that journalist Dan Rather is tweeting at age 91 and just finished a course of Paxlovid. And how has and how has the isolation of the pandemic and all the worry associated with the virus impacted older adults? Okay. So Dinah, that's huge. Um, this 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 could be a talk in and of itself. I think I think um social media in very many ways has helped to reinforce negative ideas about aging, particularly during the pandemic. If you remember, there were a lot of negative things going on, calling the pan, calling COVID-19 the boomer remover and things like that. So there were really awful kinds of um, and actually there was a paper published about the number of tweets, the negative tweets that were coming out about older people were really very negative um, and ageist. So, you know, um, you know, Dan Rather, again, you know, is one of those terrific individuals who probably exemplifies su successful aging and he's still contributing and he's still working. We all don't know what our capabilities are going to be, but we all want to be able to function at the highest level that we can and enjoy a good quality of life. Thanks. Uh, Gita J. Ram says, thanks for a very comprehensive review. Any thoughts on cultural influences on acceptance of aging? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Keith. I would love to talk to you more about that. Um, certainly, there are cultural differences that have been spoken about. Um, I, you know, um, there are certain cultures, um, particularly, say, for instance, I think more in Japan, where older adults are perhaps more revered. But the fact that ageism is so has a global prevalence makes me think that I, I don't think we should get complacent and just say that, you know, that there are cultures we don't need to worry about, that there's such a widespread uh, negative attitude um, that is really global when it comes to aging that hasn't, that we need to be thinking about all kinds of ways in order to be able to counter it. Uh, Michael Friedman says, great presentation. As you know, one of the highest priorities of advocates in the Alzheimer's community is early diagnosis of dementia. Given the studies on rates of suicide, what do you think of that as a policy priority? Well, I'm very worried about it, Michael. You know, I'm really worried about what these two papers show, that there are increased risk of suicide attempts and completed suicide. And I really do worry that we have to be very thoughtful about how we share information when we share it. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that in these days, you know, with the 21st Century Cures Act, sometimes our patients can get information before we've shared it with them through the electronic health record. Um, that could potentially be quite damaging or devastating. And I think we need to be thinking thoughtfully about how to provide the kinds of emotional and, and psychological support to individuals. You know, that a diagnosis of dementia is not the end of life. Um, and that it's possible to be able to have meaning and well-being um, and still be part of a family and still be part of a community. We have a lot of work to do, I think, in being able to work more thoughtfully in this area. Susan, let, uh, let me come back to your point about correlation and not and not causation. You know, on this this issue of uh, of positive attitudes about aging leading, you know, being associated with longer life, you know, of course, the question that comes to mind for, for me anyway is, you know, are, are the people who have a more positive attitude the people who are more mentally and physically robust to begin with? You know, they have a better attitude. Is the attitude a result of them doing well uh, rather than it causing them to, to go on to do well? Mm -hmm. Well, I think certainly that has that is one aspect. But I think I think what some of the research has shown that even those individuals who have the physical impairment, 
and cognitive impairments can still report, have still reported high levels mm -hmm. of, of successful aging in the face of, of having some sort of physical illness or disability. Mm -hmm. I, we could, besides, you know, I think, you know, Justice Ginsburg, I can think, you know, we can think of other individuals as well who um, had some sort of disability, some sort of illness, and yet still um, had a high level of well-being. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, gosh, there's so much to talk about. Well, actually, there's one more question. Um, well, two more questions, uh, but only one more minute. <laughs> Dave, Dave Kern, uh, well, he's, his is a more point. Sarah Kalik asks a question. Based on the suicide data you reviewed, do you think all people with a new diagnosis of dementia should see a psychiatrist? Or what should geri geriatricians do, in your opinion? Um, I Well, geriatricians are probably not the ones most commonly making the diagnosis. They're probably being made by primary care physicians and probably more by neurologists than by psychiatrists. And I really think there needs to be more discussion that's happening about how to do this. Um, I was last year, I was part of a panel um, at, an, at an, a national meeting talking about the disclosure of the diagnosis of dementia, how to do it we, um, and how to do it thoughtfully. More discussions needs to be done about this, about that the, the diagnosis of dementia needs to be in a context and be thinking about what the support systems need to be um, and how it's presented to individuals. Not everybody needs to see a psychiatrist, but I think how the diagnosis is presented needs to, and, and what the context is and what the opportunities are, at least for follow-up, needs to be made available to people. Interesting point. That's a good point to end on. Uh, terrific talk, really. Very thought-provoking. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being with us. Thank you. Have a good week. Take care.